Jeff is the co-founder for Finimetrica. Finimetrica is one of the uh, leading risk tolerance software platforms that's been around for, how long have you been running now, Jeff? Uh, Almost 12, 12 years in the US. 12 years in the US, and they work in uh, across multiple continents now. So as, as financial planning is going global, and obviously risk tolerance being a part of that, uh, uh, their process has gone global as well. So they work in the UK, they work in the Canada, they work here in the US, uh, and they work in their base of Australia, which you will notice is where Jeff is from as soon as he comes up here and begins to talk himself. In interestingly enough, uh, let's see, what are we now? You probably know that, that, that Australia is ahead of the US, time-wise. I mean, in Australia, it's now early hours of Thursday morning. So that means things like uh, when the Super Bowl was played, uh, it was Monday morning in Australia, we knew the result, we just kept quiet about it because we thought, <laughs> thought that would spoil the fun. Um, one of the other things, though, it's even more interesting and more relevant, is we can see bear markets coming. Right? We know when the next bear market's going to start. First, you want to write it down? I'm sharing this exclusively here. 1st of April 2015. And it's going to be something like the dot com in 73, 74. Uh, the S&P is going to fall 5% in the first three months, 10% in the next six, 10% in the six after that, uh, and then another 5% in the next three months till it hits the bottom. Right? So it's going to run over 18 months. S&P is going to go down 30%. It'll be all over by, good news, all over by 1st October 2016. We can't quite see far enough ahead to know when it will recover. My best guess would be one to two years. Um, this is my sixth bear market, so I figure I'm an expert at this stage. Okay. Why do I mention that? I mention that because risk tolerance in good times and risk tolerance in bad times are two actually completely different things. Um, uh, I think Warren Buffett said, when the tide goes out, you see who we who's wearing swimmers, and that's very much the case. Uh, with risk tolerance. And this is the situation you want to avoid specifically, but it's, it's even just the difficulty of having to deal with clients who are uncomfortable with what's going on, uh, they want to bail from their portfolio, some will, not a good outcome. Okay. The, when, when, we, when I was asked to speak on this, I thought what I, what I would try and cover is um, what is risk tolerance, how to assess it, and how to apply that assessment in the, in the advising process. And I'm still going to do that. Um, but I, I was speaking at the, uh, at the AICPA, Advanced Personal Financial Planning Conference, in Vegas a couple of weeks ago, and I happened to go to a presentation uh, that was done there by uh, Tom Giacchetti from Stark & Stark, the fairly well-known uh, compliance lawyers, and uh, Blaine Aiken, who's the CEO of FI360. And um, they were, it, was made, it was sort of compliance and, and fiduciary standards. And uh, Blaine had a really interesting slide, I thought, which was this one. Advisors are responsible for the advice that they give. Um, certainly legally responsible for the advice that they give. And they are also responsible for the tools that they choose. They can't say, my advice was okay, but the tool was bad. Right? They need to actually be careful about the tool. Now, one of the differences between the situation advisors are in and the situation suppliers like us are in is that advisors have a legal duty of care to clients. We do not have a legal duty of care to you. When you deal with us, it's buyer beware. Right? It really is. Uh, and it was interesting questions coming from the audience at this particular conference. Quite a few of the audience challenged that and both were very clear, no, you're responsible for the tools you use. It's up to you to do the due diligence that's necessary for those. The, one of the, the things we talked about there was, was the new FINRA 2111 because that's raising standards. But the interesting thing about that is for the first time, there is a specific requirement to, to assess risk tolerance and to have regard to that uh, in the advice that you give. Um, now, when I, was, when I was here in September, I met with two of the senior people out of the Office of General Counsel at FINRA. 
I'd been introduced by the UK regulator and I wanted to find out how they thought things were going to play out here. Uh, and at that stage, they were saying, well, what we're going to do with 2111 is we're just at this stage seeing that member firms uh, have recognised that it's changed the, the situation and are uh, retraining uh, representatives and setting up systems and doing new IT. And that's going to take us, we think, till about mid-2014, and then we're actually going to have a look at how that's being implemented. OK. Um, and I said, do you know what's going on in the UK and the EU? And they said, yes, we do. And I said, do you think that's a model? And they said, well, yes, you know, we'll probably do things differently, but it's interesting to see because not only do Australia, do we know when the bear market's coming, if you look to the UK, you can see the regulation that's coming. Okay. People have heard about no commissions in the UK and some of the other things that are going on there. Okay. Um, there's a, uh, the Financial Services Authority put out a guidance paper, March 2011. Uh, they had done a, a, in their audit program, uh, they'd looked at, at, at advice over um, about an 18 month period and as a result, one of the things they came out was this guidance paper on assessing suitability with regard to willingness and ability to take risk, right? and what we would call risk tolerance and risk capacity. Okay. And what they found was half the unsuitable advice was from cases involving risk profiling failures. There were widespread shortcomings in risk tolerance assessment. Uh, bad questions were com common, questions that were poorly phrased or difficult to understand or off the topic. Nine of the 11 risk profiling systems they looked at were unsatisfactory and advisors didn't understand the tools that they were using. So I think that's what's coming down the track here and it will probably arrive at about the same time as the bear market would be my best guess. So this is what, you, this is what we have. So you can see the future in two different ways. Why do we bother doing this at all? Why don't we just ignore risk tolerance? Well, there's carrot and stick. The stick is business risk management, and that's compliance and legal claims. And the carrot is business development. If you do it well, there are all sorts of business development benefits you can get. Um, clients don't need to be persuaded that their risk tolerance is important or that it's important that you understand it. Right? So if you can show that you handle that well, then it gives you all sorts of advantages. And if you do actually handle it well, you get all sorts of benefits. But given the shortage of time today, I'm only going to talk about the business risk management aspects, and I'm going to do it in that context. Okay. Due diligence. What's due diligence? Now, we've, we've prepared a, a, a one-page document with a whole lot of due diligence questions, which some of you may have seen. Fit for purpose, true to label. That's what due diligence is. Fit for purpose, true to label. And in this context, that's what it is. Okay. So what's the problem? You just ask them and they tell you, aren't they? Isn't that what happens? Well, it's not quite that easy, is it? Some of you will know that we've been, we've been running a draw for one of these fabulous Akubra hats made out of rabbit's fur. Um, and what you had to do to enter the draw was you had to say what you thought risk tolerance was. And uh, th this is a selection of the answers that we got. Now, of course, we weren't surprised by this. Um, one of the difficulties is, for some reason, this is an area that causes lots of confusion. Uh, the ideas aren't well understood, the term is used, terminology is used inconsistently, inconsistently, and there's just, there's just a general lack of knowledge, and it's really surprising given how central risk tolerance is to what, what we do as financial advisors. Um, this is the best definition we're aware of. This comes out of the ISO's personal financial planning standards. It's not perfect because it doesn't, I don't think, quite capture the full essence and I'm working with a couple of people to try and come up with a better de definition. But part of it is that it's, it's risk where you don't know the outcome until the future. I mean, and that's what planning's about. You're, you're giving people advice today, you're not gonna know the outcome, and neither are they, of that for some time. And it might be many years. Um, and it's not just about investment. Right? Um, this, is a, this is an example of just of some risk decisions. Uh, I mean, and the classic one is, how much do I trade off today against tomorrow? Right? 
But there's also, if I've got a medium term and a long term goal, do I risk my long term goal looking after my short term goal? Right? Do I put too much money in the kids' education and finish up eating cat food? Uh, and then there are the specific ones, insure versus self-assure, tax minimisation, investment risk. Now everyone focuses on investment risk and it's important, so let's talk about that. Okay. We talk about an investment risk profile. And what we mean is we mean it's the appropriate level of risk in an investment strategy having regard to three things. Risk required, which is the risk that's associated with the return that's required to achieve the goals. Risk capacity is the uh, the level of risk the client can afford to take without running the risk of derailing their plans if things don't go as anticipated, and at least half the time they won't. Uh, and those two are financial, and you work them out with your planning software, and risk tolerance, which is how much risk clients prefer to take, and that's a psychological construct. These three very rarely line up, so there are trade-off decisions and discussions that go on, and this is the People have been talking about uh, advisor alpha. This is where some of the advisor alpha comes in. Because this, this is not about doing a test and it's over with. It's about doing a test and seeding a discussion with the results of the test. And it's the discussion that matters. We've written a paper about it. You can find it on our website. Um, okay. Risk tolerance is not an upper limit on a negative, like a pain threshold. Risk tolerance is, is a balanced point. It's not a point. It's actually a zone. It's a comfort zone. We're all different. Uh, it's where we do the trade-off between making the most of our opportunities and putting our financial well-being at risk. When we started looking at this, we, I guess, simply assumed that this was an aspect of somebody's personality. Uh, uh, it's soft stuff about an individual. Uh, and so we went looking in psychology. We thought that was the place to look. And what we found was, and I had some, I, I'd used psychometric testing in the business for, in my advising business for recruitment and organisational development. And I mean, I, uh, I've got a maths degree, and so I'm one of these nerdy calculating types. And at about 17, I discovered that not everybody thought the same way that I did, uh, which was a hell of a surprise. Uh, and so I got interested in why people are different, and I've been interested ever since. Um, what we found in psychology was that psychologists have been studying risk and risk tolerance and risk behaviour for 70 years. There's a wealth of information in psychology, very little of which has made its way across into finance and economics. What we also discovered when we went looking there, which we didn't know anything about at the time, was decision science. There's a lot of work being done on decision science. That's usually done by multidisciplinary groups, not just straight psychologists. And of course, more recently, there's neuroscience. Now, neuroscience is still at the pure research stage, and so they're finding out interesting things, and I don't know how you're going to put electrodes on somebody's head, but what we're seeing is we're seeing explanations of behaviour coming out of neuroscience. Okay. What does psychology tell us about risk tolerance? It's a psychological trait. It's a relatively enduring way one individual differs from another. So it's like um, optimism, it's like extroversion, it's like detail-mindedness, uh, it's like sociability. It's a psychological trait. It's determined by genetics and life experience. The figures around the genetics are something like 30 to 40 per cent of what the studies show, um, and life experiences. It's pretty well set by early adulthood, um, it's normally distributed, so you, know, it's not the, you don't get into the argument you get about inv our investment returns normally distributed, risk tolerances, as are the other aspects of uh, personality. Uh, there are five domains, physical, social, health, uh, physical, social, physical, social, health, ethical and financial. People behave consistently within domains but really not partially across domains. A physical risk taker may or may not be a financial risk taker. Uh, it decreases with age slowly, on average, but not for everybody. Uh, it's susceptible to major life events as, as other aspects of personality are. Uh, it can change. If some of the client experiences a major life event, positive or negative, their risk tolerance can change. Males are more risk tolerant than females and it influences all decisions. Now, it's not a driver of decisions, it's simply one of the factors that influences risk behaviour. You'll have goals, you'll have perceived alternatives, you'll have perceived risk, etc. But it's a critical factor in risk behaviour. 
If you want to get into any of this stuff in any detail, the, the, this is a really good paper to start. Uh, Elke Weber, lovely lady, uh, psychologist initially, now teaches the, uh, in the MBA program at Columbia, and she's involved in this Centre for Decision Sciences. Uh, the reason I recommend this paper is, is because, not the paper itself is a good one, but she touches on a lot of, she and the other authors, touch on a lot of the points and they've got great references. And it's an easy way into, I don't know if you've ever tried to get into a new field of, of discipline and understanding. Finding your way in can be very hard. Even better still, has anybody come across the behavioural finance team at Barclays in the UK? You know who I'm talking about? Oh, they're a gold mine. Um, about six or seven years ago, um, they got together a, a bunch of really impressive PhDs. Greg Davies heads up the team. Uh, and they're, again, it's a multidisciplinary bunch, but where they're different from, from the normal sort of range of, and these guys are all academics at some stage, or still are in some cases, is they're good at actually putting the stuff into lay speak, but they don't get it wrong. A lot of what you read in lay speak is just wrong. People don't understand the concepts or they express them badly. So investmentphilosophy.com, it's a gold mine. Um, I like to try and you know, use third parties as references. Um, I did, I've got to disclose, I'm a co-author on this paper, but there are two academics on it and it was peer reviewed <laughs> and it was published in the journal. So there's more to be learnt there. Any form of testing, the two things that are critical are validity and reliability. A valid test is tests, tests what you think it's testing, and a reliable test tests consistently with known accuracy. So using my targets as an example, valid and reliable means the bullet holes are centred on the bullseye and they're tightly grouped. That's valid and reliable. Valid but not reliable is the bullet holes are still centred on the bullseye, but they're spread. So you get, you'll get a large error. If you use a, a tool with low reliability, you get large errors. Um, uh, reliable but not valid, uh, it's accurate but it's off target. And neither valid nor reliable is off target and all over the place. Okay. And one of the things I think to note is that the valid and reliable one, not every shot is directly on the bullseye. They spread. There's an error in any system of measurement. In our case, it doesn't matter what it is. There's an error in any system of measurement. If you're using a tool, you need to know what the error is, when it arises and what its influence is. Our test... Um, Develop, maintained. Uh, I mean, I know a fair bit about psychometrics, uh, but I'm not a psychometric expert. I certainly can't do all the complicated stats. Uh, uh, we've worked with the School of Psychology at the University of New South Wales. Uh, we've got uh, certification that exceeds international standards of validity and reliability, 25 plain English. Real world questions. One of the things we wanted to do was we wanted to ask questions about situations that clients uh, could find themselves in, had find, found themselves in, or were currently in, right? So real life situations. There's a four page quantitative and qualitative report. There's a lot of information in the report. The purpose of that is to seed the conversation with clients. Now we put up a link to our questionnaire. Uh, did anybody here in the audience do it? Okay, so you've seen what the... I'm not gonna try and explain it or show the report. I don't have enough time. Go online, you can do it for free. We have comprehensive user guides that take you every step of the way through what is actually a quite complex situation. And there's a full technical manual. Uh, the updated one has got an 80-page technical report for the engineers in the audience. Uh, and if you ever want to talk about it, you can talk to me. I love talking about it. Um, uh, nobody wants to anymore. Um, I do want to say a little bit about prospect theory. We, from day one, we decided not to include any prospect theory questions in our questionnaire. Now, a couple of reasons for this. Uh, firstly, prospect theory is, is, is often misinterpreted and misunderstood. It's like the, uh, the BHB study. Um, Brinks, Hinson and B. Bauer. Huh? Yeah. Brinson Hood be about. Yeah, I always get it. The BHB, it's easier. Do people know the study I'm talking about. It's the one about the effect of asset allocations on investment performance. 
widely misunderstood. Right? Um, prospect theory is, is quite similar. Um, and now, I'm not downplaying prospect theory at all. Critical study, critical paper. Right? But what it was aimed at doing, it was aimed at disproving one of the axioms of expected utility theory. Now, expected utility theory was what un underlined finance and economics view on how people behave. And the assumption was that human beings are uh, error-free, wealth-maximising wealth calculators. Right? Now, if you think about it, that was nonsense from day one. Right? But that was, the, that was the finance theory model. And this was the, really the first chink in the armour. And subsequent studies have been pulling it apart ever since. We didn't use prospect theory questions because th they deal with situations that nobody's going to experience in real life, because they're essentially gambles. Right? Uh, you don't even get these sort of things happening in casinos. Um, but also, uh, subsequently, prospect theory is only an approximation of a... Ah, oh, the prospect in prospect theory, the term prospect is used in the sense of gamble. There's a really interesting backstory to the paper, which I'm happy to go into at some stage, but don't have time now. Who's read the... Has anybody read the actual paper in Econometrica? Ah, we've got a couple. Very good. Okay. You, you know, it's a readable paper. Go to the source if you want to understand something. Um, the other thing... So, so we, we just didn't use those sort of questions at all. Subsequently, it was discovered or it's, that, you know, the two-to-one ratio they talk about, loss gains, it actually runs anywhere from one-to-one to, one to five-to-one, and it's not stable over time. People give different results on different days. And it's also been shown that, that gambling studies reach sort of get to a conclusion that doesn't actually hold up when you look at, at financial behaviour down the track. Um, OK. We have a patent. I wish we hadn't bothered. A lot of money, a lot of time, uh, and it's in patent speak and nobody ever looks at it. Uh, much better to go to our site and look at the technical manual, and in any event, a lot of silly ideas get patented. But it seemed like a good idea at the time. Okay. Advice. Why, why are we bothering? Surely advisors know what their client's risk tolerance is. Well, that's not what the studies show. Advisors' estimates of their client's risk tolerance are less accurate than the client's, and there are a number of studies, independent studies, uh, less accurate than client's self-estimates. They exhibit gender bias. Males' risk tolerance gets overestimated, feels, females gets underestimated, and it doesn't matter whether the advisor is male or female. So it's gender, not sexist. Overweight other demographics. You know, wealthy, rich people assume to be more risk tolerant than they actually are. Uh, older people assume to be less risk tolerant than they actually are, etc., etc. Advisors' estimates correlate, and, and largely this is because the tools that most advisors use, as most people know, are pretty rubbish. It's the tick the compliance box and put it in the drawer. Um, uh, estimates correlate, uh, when tested, with test scores at 0.4. Now, what that means is that there's a serious error being made in one in six cases. Serious error is two or more standard deviations. So that's like thinking in clothing sizes that somebody's a medium when they're actually an extra large or an extra small. Okay. And, the, and the pure fact of the matter is that advisors would actually be more accurate if they made no attempt to assess risk tolerance and simply assumed everyone was average, but that would be giving the game away and the compliance people wouldn't like that. Okay. So back to due diligence. First thing, do due diligence on what you're currently doing. I think you'll finish up very unhappy. Then look at, at one of the alternatives, and you know we're alternatives, a couple of others out there, uh, and do the due diligence on them. Doing it on us, uh, we are the only scientifically validated risk tolerance testing system in the US. We, there are others elsewhere, and there are three in the UK. Uh, three in the UK, I'm aware of two in Europe, there's one in Australia, so we're not the only ones. We've been around for a long time. Right. We've got a long track record. Um, we're proven through bear markets over 15 years. Uh, we're used in universities uh, for teaching and research purposes. Um, and, and there's only ever been, and this is, this is my word, so you don't have to believe me, I'm a salesman, I'm selling. Um, but we've only, we're only aware of three legal claims involving clients who, who had done our test. None of them were successful. 
the f it's not the fact that they weren't successful that's relevant here. It's the fact that... Is that beeping at me? OK, I'm nearly done. Uh, it's the fact that there were only three claims. I mean, business risk management, the first thing you want to do is stop claims happening. Any claim is damaging. Right? It's emotionally damaging, it's financially damaging, it'll probably damage your brand. Avoid them if you can. OK, that's me. Uh, lots more information at riskprofiling.com. You can test your own risk tolerance there and you can trial our system there. OK, thank you very much. Thank you.